Turkey is a democratic, secular, and constitutional republic with an ancient cultural heritage. Since World War I, she's increasingly integrated with the West through membership in the Council of Europe, NATO, and the G20 major economies. Turkey began full membership negotiations with the European Union more than a decade ago. Historically, she's been Israel and America's strongest ally. Zafer Aiken is an experienced litigator in the areas of discrimination, sexual harassment, civil rights litigation, and employment law. Born in Konya, Turkey, Mr. Aiken received his JD from Hofstra University in 1994 and a BS in Accounting and Business Administration from Brooklyn College. He is the president of the Turkish Cultural Center with 12 branches throughout New York State. He's been a member of the Turkish American Business Forum for more than a decade. Zafer, welcome to Breaking Through. Thank you very much for having me, Bill. Pleasure to be here. I'd like to start off our discussion about Turkey and the U.S. by asking what you feel is Turkey's place in an increasingly changeable Middle East. Can Turkey stabilize the Arab future? Uh, we hope so. Uh, it is definitely beginning to look more that way. Uh, historically, Turkey's had always, Turkey always had very close ties with, uh, with the Arab neighbors, whether it be family members from Turkey and the Arab states, uh, or whether it just be Turkey's geographic location, the trade that they do, or even dating way back to the Ottoman era, where Turkey had some control and rule over the Arab states. Uh, that uh, taken into consideration with the fact that these are both predominantly Muslim nations gives them one more additional uh, item that's in common, if you will. From that perspective, uh, Turkey does have a lot of influence, and also being more of an economic power in the region gives it more clout in the area. Mm -hmm. What, what about actually the, the changes that have been ongoing in the Arab states over the past six months? Has this been cause for concern for people who live in Turkey? I don't think it's been a cause for people that live in Turkey. I think they welcome it. Uh, the changes that have been happening in the Middle East uh, kind of uh, is geared towards taking these nations and bringing them more in line with Turkey. Uh, that is that to be a, um, nation, a nation that's predominantly Muslim and yet still secular and democratic. Uh, unfortunately, these states have not always had this kind of track record. Uh, and for a long time, while things were basically kept away from the general public, from the people in general, uh, these rulers, I think, were able to basically freely uh, rule as they wished. With the internet, with media being what it is today, uh, Yeshua being a prime example, uh, knowledge is everywhere. And these people, the public in general, started seeing Turkey as a nation that's similar to their nation, and that's democratic, that's uh, prospering, uh, that's more aligned with uh, uh, the West, uh, and that is very civilized. And I think they all envy Turkey and want to see their own nations follow in Turkey's footsteps. So I think it's been uh, more of a relief for Turkey to mm -hmm. see them uh, following in those footsteps. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. You know, I, I know that you came to this country rather young and were educated in American schools. You know, you've obviously maintained very close relations with your country of origin. Your children, I, I would imagine, are bicultural and, and bilingual. Um, is this characteristically Turkish, keeping ties with the old world? Uh, I think more so in the Turkish uh, community than some of the other communities. But then again, the Turkish community is still very new. Uh, if you were to compare the Turkish community to the Italians or to the Irish or to the German, uh, we're still, I mean, I, I'm not even considered first generation. My children will be first generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we're down the line and it's the third, fourth, fifth generation, uh, how uh, those ties to uh, Turkey will be, I guess time will tell. But for our generation, uh, for uh, people that came around the same time that I did, and for our children, we do have close ties, and we have close ties because we still have a lot of family, a lot of friends, a lot of memories in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, travel uh, has definitely advanced, where going and coming is not as big an issue as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you look at certain, say, European-based uh, communities or people that came to the United States, uh, the first thing they got did after getting off the boat or off the plane was to, in some cases, change their name, get a new suit of clothes, and try to blend in as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of been the, 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 the style of a lot of Europeans coming to this country. So I'm, my, my mother's from Belgium, and certainly the, the changeover to becoming an American was something that was highly motivated in her case. Uh, I think Turkey is definitely an exception to that. It, uh, it clearly uh, is. It, Turkey is not the same way. Turkish people have a very proud past. They're, they're very proud of their heritage. They're very proud of their motherland, if you will. And I guess the feeling uh, of Turkish people is, as uh, Marty Markowitz uh, said it, uh, the Brooklyn Borough President, you can have two lovers. And uh, the Turkish people seem to have two lovers, uh, that of their original nation, Turkey, and their adopted nation of the United States. 
Yeah. You know, we're going to talk more about that a bit later in terms of uh, the responsibility that Turks seem to feel for their kind of adopted country. You know, there's actually a lot of, uh, a, a lot of strong uh, com commitment that seems to go along with being, uh, being in New York and being in the United States. We'll, we'll get more on that a little bit later. But how would you say Americans perceive Turkey? You know, what about the average American and the American government? Um, well, the American government is a different story, but as far as the average American is concerned, unfortunately, the average American doesn't really know people of Turkish descent and Turkish heritage. Uh, a, a, until at least very recently, a lot of times when we spoke to people, they would assimilate Turk or they would associate Turkish people with Arabs, with the Middle East, uh, and uh, Turkish people are not Arabs. Uh, they're not, even though they come from Anatolia, it, it really isn't the Middle East. Uh, so Turkish people have uh, a heritage, a culture that's very different. Uh, than the Arab world. Uh, in that regard, I don't think most of the American people really know the Turkish community yet, uh, and which is what one of the functions of the Turkish Cultural Center. Uh, at the Turkish Cultural Center, what we strive to do is two things, actually. One, introduce the Turkish community to the United States, to their neighbors, to their friends, to their brethren, if you will. But at the same time, also take the Turkish community and introduce them to America. Believe it or not, a lot of Turks that uh, live in the United States uh, have kept to themselves. Some of them haven't uh, uh, gotten as politically or socially involved. Uh, their social life, for the most part, has still been associated with Turkey. And we try to get them more involved with the United States and basically introduce them to their adopted country uh, because this is uh, where they're, you know, they're, they're home for the uh, God the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at my last, uh, last check, last count, uh, slightly over half of Turkish women are, uh, they wear the traditional um, headscarf, while a significantly smaller number uh, of t American Turkish women do the same. How is the westernization of Turks in the United States perceived by their families? Is it, is it seen as a threat, or do you find traditions, especially religious traditions, are fairly upheld here in the U.S. by American Turks? You know, um, this is a question that actually comes up quite often in the United States. Uh, and there's a perception somehow that, uh, uh, you know, the family or uh, has something to do with women deciding to wear uh, a head cover or not. Uh, that is actually a very individual choice, individual issue. Uh, for most families, my family being a prime example, my mother covers her head, my wife doesn't. Um, I have a lot of cousins that do and I have a lot of cousins that don't. Uh, but in the Turkish community, this is really rather accepted very broadly. It's kind of like one person wearing a tie and one person not wearing a tie and they can still come sit together and they can have a cup of tea or they can hang out, they can talk, they can go to school. And no one will even notice that one is wearing a tie and one is not wearing a tie. So this actually is not as big an issue with the people as it is uh, here in the United States because it's perceived to be an issue. Uh, unfortunately, Turkish politics uh, in the past have made this an issue as well. Uh, they made this a political issue uh, in Turkey, uh, saying that uh, women didn't have a right uh, to cover their heads, uh, and it was somehow conceived to be uh, going backwards, if you will, uh, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. And, and this was rather disturbing for a lot of the Turkish community. It was disturbing for myself personally, uh, and not because my wife covers her, she doesn't, but it was disturbing because the people that they were preventing from attending schools in Turkey were the exact same people that they were trying to protect, the women. So this didn't affect men, and yet it was women's organizations that were going out there that were sponsoring these bills to say that women that cover their hair shouldn't be able to attend universities or attend schools, and at the same token, their agenda was to protect an advanced woman. So the two didn't really go hand in hand together. Uh, but uh, people have really, uh, I think, risen above that. And in today's Turkey, Everyone is very cognizant of, of the fact that this is an individual liberty issue, it's a freedom of religion issue, it's an individual choice issue, and it doesn't really involve the family and it most certainly should not involve the government. Mm -hmm. So could, would you say by inference then that women's rights are more upheld uh, in Turkey today by token of the fact that no one is forced, in other words, no one is forced to wear the headscarf. That's something that they're free to do if they choose to do so. Would you say that that might be interpreted as an expression of women's rights? They have the right to do it or not to do it. They're not going to become ostracized, for example, if they choose not to wear it. Absolutely. Uh, well, Bill, I, I, I would say, uh, yes, uh, today uh, there's definitely more liberties and freedom in Turkey, uh, and that is largely due to the government that's in power uh, currently. Uh, but uh, again, the issue was never that 
women were forced to wear or to cover their head. The main issue uh, was the fact that uh, young, young ladies, especially young ladies, that chose to cover their head because of their ideal beliefs or their individual beliefs weren't allowed to do so, and yet still take a job in a government office uh, or yet attend even a university, the most basic rights that we have here in the United States or that any uh, civilized nation should have. So uh, the exact opposite was true, actually. There was a great deal of pressure for the younger uh, ladies and even the ones that were working in the government offices uh, not to cover their heads. And uh, slowly with AK Party, uh, that is now uh, being uh, more relaxed, and women are now allowed and granted more freedom to express themselves in the manner that they see fit. Mm -hmm. Just to change gears a bit, I, you know, recalling some some recent discussions about the United States' cooperation with Turkey in the pursuing of terrorists, the American ambassador underscored U.S. cooperation on both the short and long term with Turkey. What are your insights into this discussion about uh, Turkey and the United States' partnership, if you will, in the, it, it, with respect to international terrorism? Well, Turkey uh, it shares, not only shares the United States' concern uh, about fighting terrorism, Turkey has been a much larger victim than the United States has been. Unfortunately, until the incidents of 9-11, we in the United States didn't really see terrorism. We didn't really experience terrorism. We didn't really live through terrorism. And as bad as the incidents in, the, in, in September 11th were, and I was a, a person that uh, saw the incidents firsthand, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's Your offices are right down there on my, uh, Lower the, Broadway, correct? Uh, the first plane went flying in front of my window, and I actually oh, saw the first impact. And I don't think I've ever experienced something more horrific in my life. And that's a sad memory that will stay with me forever. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, you know, we, we lost approximately 3,000 innocent lives in the World Trade Center. Turkey has lost over 30,000 uh, lives to terrorism uh, over the years. So uh, Turkey knows firsthand uh, what it means to be victimized uh, by the terrorists. And uh, having lived with that fear and with that concern, uh, again, Turkey not only shares the United States' concern, Turkey is probably more of an advocate and more of a push uh, to eradicate all sorts of terrorism worldwide. Mm -hmm. happy to be a part of this festival. I know it's a first annual festival, so I'm very um, excited about that. It's been a great, a wonderful opportunity, so many different films, different mm -hmm. topics, and I've just I've enjoyed it. I personally had harbored a desire or an ambition to do a film festival, but had not gone about doing anything for it because I knew it was a lot of work and I didn't have the time. So. Luckily for us, Dennis decided to do it. I'm very happy to be accepted here at Dennis's great festival. And you know, when you put a lot of work into something and you get acknowledged, it makes you feel good. You know, America has derived greatly from its reliance upon Turkish airspace in the Iraq conflict. Uh, has Turkey always felt appreciated? and fairly compensated for its reliability as a U.S. ally in the region? Um, unfortunately, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, we would, uh, to the Turkish and I'm, I'm glad you're being honest about no, that. It's, you know, um, w during the first Gulf War, uh, it was uh, President uh, Bush that spoke to Özel uh, at the time uh, about uh, the Turkish cooperation uh, and use of Turkish airspace and Turkish cooperation uh, being a border state to Iraq. And uh, Turkey uh, did give full cooperation uh, because it was a rightful cause. It really was. Uh, uh, this was not like the second uh, 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 Iraqi incident. It was the first one mm -hmm. uh, where Saddam Hussein had unjustifiably unprovoked uh, invaded Kuwait. And they needed to get out of there. And they needed to be pushed out of there. So Turkey gave unyielding support and really all of its resources uh, to the United States because Turkey joined the United States in the belief that uh, we had to preserve uh, stability in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that regard, you have to understand, you know, every nation does most of their trade with countries that border them. And one country that borders Turkey was Iraq. So this incident significantly had a very significant effect, a negative effect, on Turkish trade. Uh, was Turkey ever reciprocated for that? Well, they weren't. For example, uh, Egypt was granted, uh, I think, uh, an $8 billion uh, loan relief. Uh, Turkey didn't ask for a loan relief. But what Turkey asked for was the United States to treat Turkey more 
of more like a, a true ally, a true friend, uh, to grant Turkey most favored nation status, for example, to allow more trade to come through, to uh, restrict uh, tariffs, to allow more immigration, uh, whether it's the issuing of business visas or tourist visas to be uh, issued to Turkey. And unfortunately, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, so in that regard, uh, Turkey uh, suffered economically uh, as a result of, uh, of the first Gulf War, and that loss has never been fully reciprocated. Um, I, obviously, a thank you goes a long way, uh, but we have to do a little more than just thank a nation if we want to send a message to all other nations in the world to show that the United States uh, doesn't just uh, speak what we actually follow uh, with our deeds. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you say, Xavier, that there are any bitter or hurt feelings associated with the fact that you don't feel fairly reciprocated or compensated for, you know, for this? Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say bitter, but uh, definitely hurt feelings. Mm -hmm. But also, you have to understand, you know, governments change. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, Turkey dealing with the U.S. government at the time. Mm -hmm. And Turkey was very, very cognizant of the fact that when the government changed, you know, it wasn't something that Turkey held against the United States. Uh, because again, it, w it was a it was a political move, and it was done by the government that was in power at the United mm -hmm. States. At You're the talking time. about the Bush administration the Bush versus administration. The, the Bush administration, current administration. Uh, exactly. So uh, what happened was Turkey was uh, able to limit their, uh, I guess, dissatisfaction uh, for the time. Uh, and this was a general feeling among, again, I'm not in Turkish politics, but this was a general feeling that we as Turkish people felt. Uh, you know, do we think that uh, the United States? Uh, uh, today is the same government that, uh, that was back in the day? Well, obviously not. But we also think that this is something that should be talked about, it's something that, just, that should be discussed, and it's something that uh, you know, we should keep in the f back of our mind, in the front of our mind, uh, in moving forward. That when we ask nations to stand up to the plate, uh, that we also have to be able to uh, at least alleviate some of their losses, uh, or at least recognize, and I don't mean just by words, but by deeds, uh, the sacrifice that they're making. Mm -hmm. to, your, to your knowledge, has that phone call been placed to Hillary Clinton's office? <laughs> uh, probably not in this manner, no. Uh -huh. You know, many would say that Turkish relations with Iran have been fairly positive despite Iran's issues with Israel. How about, how, how has Turkey managed to walk this line between an, the antagonists, Iran and Israel, while still being true to herself? Uh, well, I think that's exactly the point. Turkey was true to herself, and that's what allowed Turkey to walk this fine line. Uh, you know, for a while in the United States, we had this policy of isolating Iran and not speaking to Iran. Well, if you don't speak, you can't solve problems without speaking. Problems don't solve themselves. And not speaking, if it does anything, it makes nations depart further away from each other. Uh, so I think Turkey kept a very fine line and walked a very fine line uh, by keeping communications open with Iran. Uh, and it was probably one of the few nations that was able to relay uh, the message that was coming from the United States, that was coming from the West, also coming from Turkey itself. You have to understand, Turkish interest is not very different from the, from the Israeli or the U.S. interest. Uh, as far as the Iran is concerned, nobody, especially Turkey, and Turkey probably more so than any other nation, doesn't want to see a, a bordering state that's got nuclear weapons. Uh, that doesn't benefit anybody. Uh, you know, uh, I think Iran eventually has to recognize that while we have the rest of the world nations departing away from nuclear power, seeing what happened in Japan, the simplest example, uh, to still pursue uh, these kind of, uh, I don't even want to call it ideals, is not the right thing to do. Uh, but again, you know, you can't tell this is to Iran if you're not speaking to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think Turkey has done the right thing in keeping the lines of communication open. But in keeping those lines of communication open, you have to understand, Turkey is also being very straightforward with Iran. They're letting Iran know what all the benefits and all, all, all the you know, uh, adverse actions are for pursuing uh, in this path. Mm -hmm. And someone has to say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, um, Turkey and Turkish people are among the great communicators in the world, maybe by token of the fact that they, ha they happen to straddle Europe and Asia and they actually kind of, they, kind of they, they get the news, they get and give the news mm -hmm. of everyone passing through and have for thousands of years. Do you think maybe that's part of their uh, advantage and their strength in the, kind of the, in the communication that's necessary for the Middle East? Uh, well, I, I, th I think you, you nailed it, Bill. I, I mm -hmm. think you're exactly on point. I mean, Turkey in the location that it's been, uh, at one side it borders Europe, at the other side it borders the Middle East. And uh, all communications, you have to understand, you know, yeah, we have cell phones, we have satellite, and we have all connections. But, you know, when you say communication, communications are also 
one-on-one -on -one contact. So uh, Turkey is a nation that's doing trade, that's doing uh, you know, meetings, conferences, uh, that's doing social affairs, that has uh, citizens of its state who have family members in bordering states, both in Europe and in the Middle East. So in that regard, Turkey is still playing a very vital bridge role between the West and the East, uh, as far as the communications are concerned, but also as far as getting to know each other is concerned, socially. You know, uh, the biggest problem that I think we face in the world is not knowing each other. Uh, we say the world is shrinking, uh, but we have to shrink it a little more. Uh, when people get to know each other, half the animosity is gone. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that people living in New York in apartment houses still don't know the person they've lived next door to for, for 25 years. That's a shame. <laughs> That's a shame. You know, unfortunately, you know, some accuse Europe of prejudice against Turkey, especially with regard to her ascendancy into the European Union. You know, some might even extend that historical negativity to unresolved Armenian issues. How badly does Turkey want in to the European Union these days? And have things been changing of late? You know, uh, Bill, I'll tell you, uh, Turkey is now the sixth largest economy in Europe. They're larger than most U European countries. They're the 16th largest economy in the world. Uh, per capita income is over $10,000. Something, uh, I think, in the neighborhood of, I think 60% of the population is under the age of 35. They're a very educated youth. Uh, they're a very uh, experienced youth as far as skills are concerned. Uh, and we have a Europe that's aging and aging very quickly. Uh, when these baby boomers and the rest of the group in Europe start to retire, they're not going to have the manpower to work to feed the retiring group. Now, Turkey wanted to join the European Union for a number of reasons, and one was to pass the reforms that they wanted to pass, to make Turkey more democratic. Because you have to understand, Turkey had a, a bad history of military coups, uh, of almost semi-dictatorship rules by the military in Turkey, and uh, that uh, setup in Turkey had to change. And the European Union was a very good uh, excuse, if you will, if nothing else, uh, to change uh, those ways to bring Turkey more in line with Europe, to bring Turkey more in line, in line with the civilized world. So in that regard, uh, the whole application to the European Union uh, was a very good process. But in today's world, when I look to see where Turkey stands and where Turkey is going and where Europe is going, I don't think it benefits Turkey to join the European Union. Uh, you know, if, if they were to offer the uh, admission to, the, to Turkey, uh, and I had to vote on it, I would vote no. Uh, now, I'm all in favor of Turkey having an economic uh, uh, relationship with Europe, uh, lifting tariffs, lifting borders. But as far as full European membership, I don't think Turkey has anything to benefit from uh, full European membership. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Turkey would be on the losing end as far as benefits are concerned, and Europe would be on the winning uh, side as far as benefits are concerned. Uh, but interestingly enough, with all this being said, uh, Europe is still playing politics with religion. As sadly as this is, uh, you know, I don't know that this is a European Union, I think it's more of a Christian Union, if you will. Uh, because when I look at countries that have joined the Union, like Bulgaria, uh, you know, uh, even, even Greece, and you see the condition of Greece in today, Cyprus, I mean, these are countries that economically, uh, and even socially, wouldn't even get close to Turkey. And yet, uh, they're allowed to join the Union, and for what? I mean, what is the only thing that differs with these countries and that differs with Turkey? And the only thing that differs is the religion. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you take away all other causes, and what you're left with is Turkey being a Muslim nation and the European Union still finding uh, excuses and still finding obstacles and uh, reasons for Turkey to quote unquote uh, continue the application process. Um, and I'll tell you, I think we should thank Europe because if they had actually allowed Turkey to join the European Union earlier, um, it might have been a big mistake for Turkey uh, without having made all these reforms. And now that they made all these reforms and they've expanded economically, socially, and culturally, and democratically, um, why does Serbia need, need the European Union? Mm -hmm. I have a feeling if I'd asked you the same question five years ago, the answer would have been very different. You're absolutely right. Mm. F five years ago, I think there was a need for Turkey to join the European Union for Turkey to advance to the next level. Mm. Right now, Turkey is far ahead than most of the European nations that joined the Union, I think, will only be a step back for Turkey. Especially with the debacle in Greece going on as we speak, I certainly, uh, you certainly have a strong argument in terms of staying independent of the uh, European Union. Uh, yes, you know, um, what allowed Turkey to, I think, grow economically was the fact that they didn't have the pressure from the large European uh, uh, companies. Uh, I think that was one of the uh, mistakes of Greece. When Greece joined the European Union, 
I don't know that they had the infrastructure, the, 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 the corporations, the industry that was able to stand and compete with the European industries, which is what's causing some of these problems. Uh, and luckily, over the past five years, uh, definitely over the past eight years, nine years, Turkish economy has really grown significantly. Turkish industry has grown significantly. Whereas if they joined the European Union today, they can hold their own. And five years ago, they couldn't have. Uh, so if there were, would be any kind of assimilation into Europe five years ago, uh, it would have actually um, taken Turkey and lined it up more with the European nations if that's what they wanted. Uh, but by refusing Turkey's admission for this long, uh, they've actually served Turkey's purpose. No, only or not no, only. They've, they've, they did a great uh, service for Turkey. Fascinating. Zafer, Turks become good Americans. You know, they open businesses, they send their kids to good schools, and they try their best to maintain their culture and heritage at the same time as they allow themselves to be assimilated into the American melting pot. Is this a fair assessment? Uh, I think it's a very fair assessment. Uh, you know, um, interestingly, uh, I forget who it was. Uh, we, we had one of the meetings, and uh, I forget who it was that I was speaking to, but I, I, I know it was, a, it was a friend who was Jewish, and uh, what he said was very interesting. He said, you know, people call the United States a melting pot, but he said, you know, we're not exactly a melting pot. We're more of a salad. So you know, he said you can have a salad where the lettuce and tomatoes and the cucumbers don't mix together, uh, but by keeping the identity and still being a part of the salad, is so what makes for a good salad. It's what makes for a good salad. And if you take that instead and you were to mesh all that together, it wouldn't have the same good flavor that it has it by by keeping its identity and yet still being an integral part of, part of the salad. So that's how we view you know the Turkish community in the United States. You know, the Turkish community is an integral part of the society. It's an inseparable part of the society. But it's a part of the society that still keeps some of its values, some of its culture, some of its heritage. And what that does is adds a little bit of flavor, a little bit of color, and actually makes the United States, I think, a better place to live. Mm -hmm. A salad, not a consomme. A salad, not a consomme. You know, any last words, Zafer, on the matchup of the American dream and the hopes of Turkish families who come here to lay the foundation for their family's future? Uh, I think the Turkish people that are coming to the United States uh, truly come with the American dream. Uh, if you speak to them, what they want to do is they want, they want to work hard, they want to educate their children, they want to keep their family values, you know, they want to keep their faith, their religious values, uh, they want to be good neighbors, and they want to preserve and protect their country and their nation. Uh, and, and interestingly, you know, uh, Turkish people also have a heritage of giving. Uh, when you look at uh, Turkey itself, there's a lot of organizations, not-for-profits, that we call Vakuf in Turkey, which are charity organizations. Uh, and that part of the Turkish uh, life hasn't changed by coming to the United States. So you have Turkish people in the United States that are doing pro bono work, that are volunteering, uh, whether it's you know, giving to the poor, giving to the aid, volunteering services, and they're doing that here in the United States. And uh, you know, when I look at the United States, it, it almost seems like uh, there is somewhat of a fading in charities. It seems like the same kind of charities that existed 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago don't exist today. Uh, and if the Turkish uh, uh, people coming here can uh, help promote more of the charity work to occur, uh, I think that would be a very, very good thing. Uh, you know, um, charity isn't just giving uh, to the less fortunate. It's actually something that allows people to mend together, to stay together, that gets people to know each other, to like each other. Mm -hmm. Is that called the spirit of Sadaka? It's called the spirit of Sadaka. Bill, you're a step ahead of me. <laughs> I want to get that one in. We have been speaking with Zafer Aiken, prominent New York attorney and enthusiastic social leader of Tur Turkish Americans in the U.S. If you have comments, we'd love to hear them. Please email us at bttelevision at gmail.com. And please visit the Turkish Cultural Center's website, which should appear just on your screen. For my guests, Dave Rakin, and for myself, W.J. O'Reilly, be well, and see you next time. Hello, and welcome to the first installment of Breaking Through, a show about people, events, and ideas that pull us forward into a balanced and hopefully a better world. I'm your host, W.J. O'Reilly. Breaking Through aspires to taking us closer to discovering ways of transforming ourselves and the world without harming others or the planet. We leave you, we ask, what will you do to break through? For myself, W.J. O'Reilly, see you next time.